You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. I'm Matt Garrisonovich, PhD candidate at Northwestern University, studying Russian literature and film. And I'm Cameron Lalana, literature enthusiast and guy who worked in media. We're two friends who met while studying in Russia, and we like talking about books so much that we made it into a podcast. And this podcast is the podcast for people who want to learn more about Slavic literature, art, and culture. Every episode, we're going to be bringing you the background and analysis you'll need to know to understand these works. If you're interested in supporting us, you can head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. All right, Matt, what are we getting into this week? This week, we are honored to be joined by a very special guest, David Cooper, to talk about his new book, The Czech Manuscripts, Forgery, Translation, and National Myth. David L. Cooper is an associate professor and head of Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. A specialist in Czech and Russian literatures, his research is in the areas of nationalism in literature, forgery and mystification, translation history and translation studies, and the history of criticism. David has published translations of Slovak folktales and a critical edition of the poems of the Czech 19th century forged manuscripts, the Queen's Court and Green Mountain manuscripts with other forgeries of the Czech Revival, published in 2018. David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. We we read through your book. I was reading through it very, you know, very attentively because this was not something I was super familiar with prior to reading, and uh, personally, I found it quite interesting. That's nice to hear. Yeah, and it's it's good to meet actual readers of the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody says when they come on our show. Wow, you read our book. That's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, and I can't say that like every interview that I've had has been with someone who's read the books. So I, I appreciate your, your your prep. That's that's really uh, high. That's professionalism at a high level. That's great. Yeah, they're just going off the front matter, you know, just anxiously hoping that you're not going to ask a good follow up question. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so before we start talking about well, the Czech Czech manuscripts, like you know, it's a series of forged documents. Before we start talking about them themselves, it may be helpful for people who are not familiar with. Uh, this time period, what like we're talking about in general, to kind of set the scene of where our story kind of begins, and mm-hmm. we'll say roughly in eighteen sixteen, about what like what are the status of the ethnic Czechs who are living in Austro Hungary? You know, many of them are not even Czech speakers at this time. Can you kind of talk more about that? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of Czech speakers in the countryside. Um, a lot of farmers who are speakers of Czech. The cities are more mixed, right? There's lots of German speakers. And the schools, um, schooling is largely in German language, right? And so they're part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, the people who are interested in Czech language and are developing a program for the revival of the Czech language and Czech language culture, it's really, you know, no more than a couple of handfuls of intellectuals at the time. Um, They're looking back uh, a century and a half, two centuries into the past before Um, the Counter-Reformation, when the Czech language had a much larger sort of um, role in cultural life um, within the Bohemian Kingdom, when, um, you know, nobility spoke Czech, and when um, Czech was a language of education and people wrote, you know, um, literature and, and scientific studies in Czech, and that's not the case anymore. And the reason is in part because Czech language had been associated with heresy. There was a strong Czech Protestant movement, right? And so the Counter-Reformation really pushes Czech in some ways into into the margins, right? And so for for this group of intellectuals, though, for being Czech, you know, growing up in Czech families where they spoke Czech, and then being educated in German, there's a there's a feeling of a disconnect, right? Um, and uh, the sort of new ideas of nationality suggest to them that it's maybe unnatural for them to to have to learn in Czech, uh, in German, right? And to develop their um, you know education and and to write poetry in German, and a lot of them are doing that. Um, but couldn't we you know bring the Czech language back into use? Um, and so that's it's really like in 1816, you know, um, it's it's handfuls of people. It's young uh, men studying at the university who sort of afterwards get together in study groups. They're 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 starting to try. They've been writing poetry in German. They're trying to start writing poetry in Czech. Um, they're critiquing each other. They're trying to find old older things to read to learn some you know higher vocabulary in Czech and these kinds of things. So it's really um, it's it's kind of a a, a group of amateurs. Um, intellectuals who are seeing seeing if they can make something of it, and they don't 
know what's going to come of it. They don't they don't know what the outcome of that's going to be. So this is something that I found interesting in a linguistics course that I was TAing. This was mentioned a lot. It was on the Balkans. And this is something that came up a lot in the Balkans and has come up a lot in in well, a lot of different places, but this relationship between linguistics and national identity, and not just the language we speak in our national identity per se, but these sort of s small conferences or different articles that get written and really ignite this debate on what our language is, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to me that this, of course, starts to make an appearance here at this time as well. And so I was wondering if you could talk about this sort of relationship between this kind of what almost seems academic idea of language reform and mm -hmm. how actually widespread the impacts are on what end up being a, a large amount of people in this case. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because like these, what languages end up being sort of national languages, right? And where the borders are drawn on those and who gets included, you know, which dialects are considered part of language and which dialects are considered sort of marginal and maybe they should belong to another language, right? For, for linguists, it's all arbitrary. You know, we're just, we're putting down sort of dividers here. They could have been shifted over here. And you see that actually in the Czech revival because um, the Slovaks have been using Czech as a literary language for a long time, especially Slovak Protestants who have a Czech Bible translation that they've been using. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really a question. And there's, there's a number of Slovaks contributing to this Czech national movement right and the writing in, in 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 czech but the question is so is the nationality czech or is it czech and slovak and you don't really even have like slovaks having a name for themselves yet at this point and slovak hasn't there, there, there's there was a sort of catholic codification of the of, of, a, of a slovak literary language but the protestants hadn't adopt, adopted it and so um the, it's you know it's a it's a project at this point, right? The Czech literary language, you 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 have to create a norm and a sort of uh, uh, center for usage, right? That that then people can start to identify with, start to use, and it's always an adjustment from the language that you spoke at home, right? The dialect, the particular vocabulary, you have to learn that, you know. If you want to talk about a chair, you use this word and not that word because the standard language is is different from what you grew up with, right? Um, and so, you know, at, at, at some level, it's like this, it's this very artificial kind of project, but it's very powerful, right? Because when you, when you can point and you can say, look, we're all writing in this language and we're writing poetry in this language and we're writing, um, you know, uh, philosophical uh, speculation in this language, right? Um, and we share this language, right? And 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 we should be, be be learning this language in elementary school, and maybe even and they get this at the end of the century at the university, start to use this as a language of education, right? And so that's very much they're aiming in that in that direction, and they get there. Um, but at the beginning, it's 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 um, it's a lot of sandbox play <laughs> in some ways, <laughs> right? It, it's 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 trying things out and sort of you know we're going to say it this way. They're they're borrowing lots of terms from other Slavic languages because they they feel they're lacking sort of a poetic language and also like terms for for technologies and new scientific ideas and so on, right? I mean the 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 the, the developed check that they're looking at from two hundred years earlier is missing a lot of things for them. I know we're still kind of dancing around the, the Czech manuscripts, which is what this whole podcast is about, but I want to kind of narrow in on, you know, this particular era in the 19th century and this like emerging idea of history and like the, the history of an individual people or the ones that they have themselves. Mm -hmm. um, why in this era does the this idea start to become increasingly like vital and important and people are starting looking towards recovering specific cultural artifacts like these manuscripts like you know, looking back at those at these, these work from 200 years ago, why, what's making this so important to people at this time? Yeah. Um, for me, I think that the, the key sort of development is uh, an idea of national history and national culture, right? And it's more, it's more sort of about who we are as a nation, right? And in order to understand who we are as a nation, we sort of have to understand how did we coalesce, right? How did we as a group sort of differentiate ourselves, distinguish ourselves, come to have certain identifying features, right, that now represent us as a distinct group of people. And in order to figure that out, you look to the past, right? And, and particularly for romantic nationalism, origins are key, 
um, origins, and we'll talk about too about originality, right? The the idea that um, your your national origins are at a place in a, a sort of distant past, but it, those 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 origins contain the seeds of who you are going to become as a people, right? There's certain character traits. There's there's you know certain belonging to a, a territory that maybe you weren't there before, and suddenly you settle there and you start to you put down roots, right? Um, and so. Um, and the reason they're looking so much to the past, to literature of the past, is that in the contemporary period, literature is sort of the leading cultural form. It's the leading art form. It's the leading sort of intellectual um, um, marker of culture, of cultivation, right, of learning, and so on. And so they look, they look to the literature of the past as a sort of sign of we can read out of that um features of our national identity right what what were we like what were we what you know who were our enemies how were we engaging with them how are we conducting our business as a group of people and these kinds of things and and um you know they they, they look to uh old chronicles and historical accounts as well but in in some ways the stories in, in literature are, are really powerful for asking those you know those questions about who are we yeah, I have to always remind my students of this when I teach them about things that are to them old, quote mm -hmm. unquote, right? That, you know, especially I work a lot on films, so I'll say, okay, this might seem like you have always had this device that has always existed in film that you've watched. Well, this is brand new for 1920 or 1950, 1970. It didn't exist then. And likewise, here we have this sort of creation of a literary language, which is something that, of course, uh, we kind of tend to take for granted, or some of us can, right? Because we live in a culture which has a literary language. It's very interesting, the kind of tracing the formation of this, how it can be uh, it's almost at times what feels like artificially, maybe you could say created, and how it then spurs or could spur an organic movement from it. And so as we talk about this, I think we can finally you know, hit the nail on the head here. So We've circled around history, what what it means to be alive at this time, right? So what are the Czech manuscripts? How do they fit into this burgeoning debate on literary language, on national identity, all of these topics? If you yeah. could very neatly and concisely sum up and answer to all those questions, that would be... <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure, right. I'm sure um, super easy, right? You know, I wrote a book about that, so let's see what I can... <laughs> um, so there's the, there's two main manuscripts, but there's actually a handful of other sort of single sheets of parchment with other kinds of uh, things on them as well that sort of emerge around them. But the the two two main manuscripts, um, the Queen's Court manuscript and the Green Mountain manuscript, uh, were discovered. They appeared. They were staged as discovered in 1817 and 1818 um, by Václav Hanka, by his roommate Josef Linda. And, and sort of um, those are two of our main suspects in terms of people who manufactured them as well. Um, and what they were are, are, you know, collections of parchment with writing in old Czech on them. And when you look more closely, it turned out that the writing was poetry. Um, and a couple kinds of poetry, probably the most important thing for them at the time was epic songs, you know, songs of battles, sort of like the Iliad and the Odyssey, but much shorter, right, about how the Czechs had fought off, you know, invasions of the Saxons and of the Tartar Mongol boards and these kinds of things. There were love songs, you know, sort of folk lyrics, um, and there were, there were some sort of like in between length ballads, um, also sort of folkloric in form. The one, the one manuscript, the Queen's Court manuscript, and the name comes from um, Dvor Kralove, the town where it was found. Um, so we've sort of translated the name of the town for the, the, the name of the manuscript. Maybe it's better translated as someone, someone suggested in the Queen's Estate rather than Queen's Court. But that's sort of the name that's, that previous translators have used, so I stuck with it. Um, and the Green Mountain Manuscript was found in Zelenohora, literally Green Mountain, which is the name of a castle in another part of Bohemia, um, where it took research, actually, um, a couple decades after the, the, the manuscript appeared because it was mailed into the National Museum. They figured out that where it had been mailed from and where it had been found. Right? And so they, the, the one manuscript represents itself as, you know, Czech writing from the late 13th, early 14th century um, poetry. That's a larger manuscript. Right. Then the second manuscript is represents itself as much older, 
by its writing forms and by the older forms of the language as sort of ninth to 10th century. Um, so we would have put it, you know, a couple of centuries earlier than any forms of Czech writing that had been found to that time. This is something that they had been looking for because uh, people are starting to write new histories of European literature, right? And they're looking for the origins and they're finding Beowulf in English, right? They're finding the Song of Roland in French. It's actually not quite in French. It's in more in a Norm, Nor, uh, Norm, Norman, Normandy dialect, right? Um, and, and so the Czechs are looking and, you know, the, the Russians have found the, the tale of Igor's campaign or the song of Igor's campaign. Um, the South Slavs have these, these epic songs that they've been singing for centuries and that, that are still being collected at that time. And so the Czechs are looking for their material and they're not finding it, right? But this is sort of key material because the idea, it's sort of like the Greek, Greeks are the model nation and the Greeks invent literature and right and the beginning of Greek literature is Homer it's epic it's songs about the the battles that sort of form the the group of people um and the, so that sort of model is then brought over to European literature and these kinds of medieval epics are are seen as sort of uh European origins for uh, distinct European literary traditions um and so the Czechs are looking for this material and they're not finding it until they do right Actually, um, Frantisek uh, Palaski, who is known as the father of the Czech nation today, he, because he wrote the first history of the Czech nation um, a couple of decades later, at a time when he was one of the big defenders of the authenticity of these manuscripts, he wrote a response to the discovery. And it was sort of, oh, thank God, it hadn't all been destroyed. We finally found, we knew it existed, right? We knew that as Czechs, we're Czechs, we're a nation, we're like all these other peoples that are finding these things, so we must have it too, and finally Hanka found it, right? Um, and so that it was it was completely desired, expected, um, and it totally fit their model of, you know, what, what how their literature sh must have developed, right? So it filled a big lacuna, a big gap um, in, in their uh, manuscript collections, and it, and it sort of was right on the you know right on the nose. It hit the nail right on the head in terms of what they what they wanted to find. As as you mentioned in your book, uh, when these initially uh, are are published, there are there are some detractors, primarily the professor Dabros Dabrowski, uh, who's mm -hmm. kind of more so halting it. But broadly speaking, as you as you say, these are like filling a niche, which this burgeoning nationalist movement are like. This is okay. This is our history. This is here. So it's really difficult to criticize it. Broadly speaking. But over the course of the next like half century or so, so you start seeing this fragmentation, people going different ways on this, and mm -hmm. you know people suddenly you can you can criticize it. You can be a serious mind. You can be an upstart. You can approach this and really be like, hey, I don't think this is what it you know cracked up to be. Uh, can you kind of talk about like what led to this or the I guess the status around the disapproval? Like what was the changing? Were the changing things in in this nationalist movement in the politics in academics towards it? Yeah. So the, the initial skepticism of Dobrovsky sort of goes away. There's a few people that are with him. He passes away in, in um, 1829, and they start um, publishing them more broadly. And uh, a couple of people write, learn defenses that sort of go against Dobrovsky at some point published his, his arguments about not the Queen's Court manuscript, only the Green Mountain manuscript, why that one was probably a fake. Um, and so they sort of cleanse it from these doubts, right? And for so the middle part of the century, uh, there's really no doubters anywhere abroad among Czech patriots. Um, and it's sort of in the second half of the century that the voices start to emerge. So some of the smaller forgeries around them um, come into like, come under scrutiny, and a couple of them are found to have been falsified, right? The two main manuscripts, though, have have established themselves at this point as sort of almost sacred objects of Czech national ident identity and the part of the national mythology. And so it's really, um, really hard for the, the Czech community to, to criticize them. But the momentum sort of builds and more of the other forgeries around them start to be exposed. Right. Um, and what's also happening is Czech historical linguistics is advancing and people are starting to understand better and better the old Czech language. And they're having to make exceptions for the language of these manuscripts in comparison with other uh, old Czech uh, language documents that they're finding, right? And they can say, well, of course, this is folkloric material. It's kind of different from the other material. And so there's reasons why the language might be different. 
Um, but at some point, the, the, the distinction starts to become a problem, right? Um, and what, when, when the um, attacks really start to come, when the, the attempts to unmask the, the forgery comes, it's actually when something I mentioned earlier, the, the, the university in Prague splits into the Czech and German faculties. And it's some of the new young faculty members in the Czech side Right. This was something this was a big goal to the Czech national movement to get this you know, opportunity for higher education in Czech. And one of the first things it brings is, is professors who want to unmask the forgeries. Right. Um, you know, and so it's Jan Gebauer, who is the leading uh, linguist of the day. And it's Tomasz Masaryk, who's going to become the first president of Czechoslovakia, who's a young a sociologist. And they sort of step out onto the, like the, the you know, public scholarship with, hey, you know, we have big doubts about these things. Um, and uh, that does not make the vast majority of the Czech nationalist um, movement <laughs> happy at all, mm. right? Um, the, 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 the manuscripts had sort of become a, 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 an object of faith, really, like the belief in, and it was, the, the arguments initially against them came from outside the Czech community, right? From Czech Germans or from, you know, other people abroad, sort of outsiders who, they couldn't know Old Czech well enough to, to have doubts, right? The argument could always be made. But now it's coming from experts from within the Czech community. And it really, um, it becomes quite ugly quite quickly, actually. Um, uh, Masaryk and Gebauer and the others participating in this campaign of articles in, in you know, scholarly journals, uh, putting forward the evidence for why they're, why they're false, they get attacked, they get called national traitors. There's a lot of personal um, uh, innuendo directed against them. In public, they have difficulties. Um, the Bauer's daughter had trouble with one of the teachers in her school. Um, and there were <laughs> fights broke out among German and Czech students in cafes. And, you know, it, it, it really, <laughs> it becomes, you know, the kind of divided political question um, that we might recognize from today's culture wars <laughs> um, in this country, actually, mm. uh, in some ways. Yeah, I, th I think that was an important point from the book, because a lot of times when we talk about debates or when we're reading academic books on debates, they're not always debates that were really involving a, a large group of the people that you know, we're alive at this time, but this mm -hmm. really seemed to stand out as something that was really getting people upset. And you could understand why, right? As we're talking about this being an integral part of their national identity, it makes a lot of sense. And so I can understand why you would be drawn to the subject. It's fascinating. And so I was kind of wondering when you were writing your book, what sort of motivated you to write the book aside from probably just the general interest in the subject but mm -hmm. what sort of aspects of this discussion do you think were missing or have been missing that you were hoping to address with your book yeah um so i started this book maybe around 2009 2010 i was finishing up another book project at the time and sort of starting i mean this and it's this related to the topic of that book which was examining sort of the development of ideas about national literature um in in bohemia and in russia um and, you know, I certainly became familiar in the process with the forged manuscripts and sort of how they had played a role in that. Um, and I wanted to go deeper in part because there, there was some material in English on the topic, um, not a lot of it. And some of it was um, wrong factually at times. Um, and actually, the largest article about it that talked about this dispute and over the, the authenticity um, came with the tone of the period when they were sort of being exposed as uh, false. So the tone was, oh my goodness, look, we've put our faith in something that was completely false. We need sort of a national reckoning. We've, we've been deceiving ourselves, right? And these, these awful forgers, look what they did. They've deceived us for all these years. And it has this very sort of, you know, the, the tone of look at the, the, the huge transgression that was committed against us. And in reading about, you know, sort of, discussions of forgery and mystifications in literature, um, there had been a lot of work done in, in English literature and, and uh, on 
um, sort of rehabilitating forgers and looking at forgery as uh, a process that's natural to literature. I mean, you know, we're writing fiction a lot of the time anyway, and forgery is just fictionalizing sort of the origins of the documents, right? In, which themselves contain epic poems, which are kinds of fictions, right? Um, and, and to see it as, you know, um, an interesting sort of phenomenon within, within literature where there's sort of legitimate falsification that we do all the time in creating literature and illegitimate falsification that sort of gets sanctioned and, 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 and pushed aside. And so there was these efforts to rehabilitate um, forgers in, in uh, a few, you know, English and Scottish forgers um, from, from that literary history. And I didn't see as much of that in the Czech discussions. There were some, right? But I, I felt like the, that Hanka and Linda um, maybe deserved, you know, instead of a program for like having committed this crime against the Czech nation, credit for having actually provided something that was very useful for the Czechs to the Czechs for many decades. And actually, as, a, as a, in the in the time that I'm working on the book, the 200th anniversary of the discovery of the Queen's Court manuscript is coming up. It happened in 2017, and so there's a, a group of Czech colleagues that are also starting to work on the manuscripts and working in similar directions. Um, and so some of the things that I had hoped to sort of talk about and, and discuss, they were also talking about and discussing. And so it really became a, a nice collaborative process of, of trying to bring a new way of, of um, thinking about this. And, and also, it's, it's just not a Czech phenomenon, but mm -hmm. putting it into the context of European cultures in general, where you see um, maybe not this the, the, as, as sort of uh, large and um, controversial literary forgery but it was happening in all kinds of ways big and small in other places as well definitely i wish i'd written down i wish i uh where exactly this comes from but you said it wrote a really interesting point or you're like maybe we should shift from you know understanding this as a forgery to frankly as the most successful poetry of its generation in a way even if it is you know purporting itself to be something else it still had that effect mm -hmm. um and so kind of pulling from our discussion on, on like these national literary myths which are creating nationalist movements at these times uh you write in, towards the start of chapter one that we can understand this work and kind of rephrasing what i said before you know as an attempt not to falsify history quoting from me here but to rescue and resurrect history to construct the czech epic in its most probable form and we're, we're already kind of along that line you know in the last question but you, can you talk more about like how we are kind of reinterpreting or re-understanding um forgeries like this but also of course as you say forgeries that happen across many other movements at this time uh, now, yeah, I mean, and and I look to the example of um, James McPherson, who was the publisher of the poems of Ossian in the 1760s, right? And he's drawing on existing oral traditions in in the Scottish Highlands, traditions that were shared with with Ireland about their um, you know national heroes from the past. And Ossian is sort of the the warrior poet, the figure who sings about the exploits of 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 his father Fingal and and of the other warriors, right? Um, and you know, it, he he does this, and he first translates into English this material out of a demand that's coming from the literary centers, from from Edinburgh and Scotland, but then also from London, right? And he gets patrons who who pay his way to go out and try and find this material and then translate it. Um, what he finds it doesn't meet his expectations, right? So the existing oral materials it, are. Um, there's a lot about Christianity there, and he knows that in the period when this stuff is supposed to have happened, it's before the Christianization, right, of, 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 of the Irish and the Scots, right? Um, and so he sees that as sort of a, like, there's a lot of appeals to St. Patrick, for example, right? And 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 St. Patrick enters into dialogue with Ossian in some of the authentic material, right? But for him, that's a later sort of addition. And so um, he's looking for a more authentic sort of ancient voice, and he finds sort of echoes of it in the material, but nothing that he can like just literally translate that to him represents the ideal of the, the epic poetry of the, of the Scottish past. And so he takes the materials that he has and he sort of reworks them and he, he takes out the, the, the Christianity, right? And, and he takes out the things that he thinks don't belong to it. So he's, he's aiming at yeah, he, and all of this, of course, we see today as falsification, right? This he's altering the oral tradition. He's 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 remaking it according to his own model. But it was ultimately aimed at what 
he understood and what his his patrons and the people asking for the material understood as sort of the the, the truth behind it like what we want to know what the ancient voice of of the scottish people sounded like and he's attempting to recreate it right um and i think his translations which are seen again as sort of you know mystifications forgeries right they're they're a small mystery that's aiming at a larger truth behind it, right? The falsification of the materials that he has is because he finds those materials to be untrue to um, what he understood to have been the primal form of the material, right? And I think with the Czechs, we can look at it the same way. Um, the Russians have epic songs. The South Slavs have, have epic songs. As Slavs, as Czechs, we must have had it too. But when we go to our, you know, to our manuscript collections and so on, we don't find it. There's all kinds of reasons for that. There were wars that destroyed manuscripts, especially because of the religious, um, the Protestant movement, right? There was a lot of damage to this. So what do we do then, right? We believe, I mean, and, and on the model of the Greeks, but also the Russians and the other Slavs, we believe that we had it. So maybe we can reconstruct it, right? And again, so it's, it's, these man, I see these, you know, there's a clear attempt to make the, the manuscripts look real, look authentic, right? And to, to fool people into thinking that they're, they're, they're genuine medieval manuscripts. So there's, there's on one hand that very deliberate falsification, but I think it's aimed at what they consider the truth. We don't necessarily consider it true today. That the, all literatures, national literature started in an epic tradition. But at the time, that was sort of the reigning understanding, right? So it aimed at that larger truth. What, what did the Czech tradition look like in its infancy? And I think they did a remarkable job of creating something quite appealing, believable, especially within that sort of way of understanding things, right? Um, that made it very hard to critique for a long time, too. It looked like truer than true. <laughs> it was exactly <laughs> what they expected to find. Right. Yeah, that is that is true. And so there is a portion of your book, too, where you, and you've addressed this already, how the reception now and kind of as they're being unearthed as forgeries is the sense of transgression of something that has been done to us uh, with this intentional ill will, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, and it's a real, it's a you know a psychological blow to the idea of Czech national identity. But you go into this debate on kind of how we perceive literature nowadays and this relationship between romanticism and forgery and how that informs why that reaction may have taken place. But then you kind of go towards this this new reading that we've been discussing and why we don't have to necessarily perceive it as that. And so I, I was wondering if you could touch particularly on this romanticism and forgery. I thought that was a really interesting framework that you were working with during that portion. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's some of my earliest work, actually, um, towards the book was thinking about sort of what is it about romanticism um, that seems to solicit forgery to make it, um, because there's a lot of it that happens at that time period, right? Um, and yet, when we think about romanticism, we think about ideas about authenticity, originality, right? Um, and 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 you know, sort of poets who are sort of originators of tradition, national poets, right? Pushkin, Shakespeare, these kinds of characters, right? But also Ossian, right? Who was seen as sort of the origins of Scottish, you know, literary traditions. Um, so. The, the understanding that I came to was sort of that, you know, as, as these ideas emerge about originality, national origins, and, and authenticity, they, they understood stood them at the time, I think, a little bit differently than how they came to be understood in a more sort of scientific, sort of, you know, um, grounded in facts kind of ways. When they're not talking about authenticity, they're talking about something that sounds how they expect it to sound, how they imagine the ancient voice to sound, right? And and originality, it's funny because they want, you know, um, the national literatures are looking for new forms, new new forms of poetry. We don't want to keep imitating the classics anymore. National literatures and, and the Germans have sort of like pioneered this and, and, and English literature has sort of developed some of its own with Shakespeare and others, forms of drama and forms of poetry that don't rely on classical models anymore. Right. And so we're looking for these sort of new forms and new ideas, um, but they want it to be sort of created out of nothing. Right. 
that's not really how literary creativity happens. It happens through rewriting, through taking this material and shifting it and refocusing it and changing it a bit and, and putting it to new purposes, right? And translation plays a big role in that. And so there's all these people doing translation, but then at some point, this sort of idea of originality comes into conflict with translation. We want our writers not to be translating. We want them to be writing their own, you know, new poetry. Um, and so forgery is kind of in, in a similar position, right? You're asking people to come up with things that are quite difficult, right? New forms, right? Connected to authors that are sort of founders of tradition. Um, you may not find that in your literary past, right? And you may need to invent it. Um, and it's sort of begging the invention of this kind of thing, right? Um, but then the, you know, the things that, the, that the values that those invented authors embody eventually come to be the values that cause you to question forgery as a method, right? Um, so there's this, there's this push for the kinds of materials that in some ways forgery is best equipped to supply, right? And then later you come back and you look at it and say, well, our, our, our understandings of authenticity today don't fit with that anymore, right? Um, and so I, that's that's sort of the um, it, it, it's like romanticism gives birth to a lot of forgery. It also gives birth to the the the, the ideas and values that are going to take and, and 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 try to take all those forged things and, and push them out of literary practice. And uh, we've been kind of talking about a lot of sort of like the background of your of your book, I and mean, then this is we're we're getting into it a little bit more now. But a major through line of 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 why this is being written, as I understand it, is each era of understanding the Czech manuscripts have kind of been like, this is the final word on the matter. Uh, these are the manuscripts. These are what they mean for our history. Oh no, there are forgery. Everything is lost. And now this book uh, is is part of an attempt to kind of say, hey, let's take a look at this and let's see the, let's be productive about the impact it's had in history. I'm not interested in telling you what exactly this means, but can we start analyzing the ways this has influenced things? And you, you take a couple different methods to approach that. And I was wondering if we could Kind of talk through each each chapter in your book of the four main chapters are each addressing a different one. The first one's kind of talking about, you know, this romanticism in poet and forgery, but we also use digital methods to start breaking down the themes and the the vocabulary here, the methods of translation, which you've kind of touched upon in, in talking about the the Scottish poetry and as as well as like even even religion, as you mentioned very early on, like the, uh, this kind of took took almost a place of religion in absence of like you know, saying, oh, our original culture was not a Christian that was imposed upon us. And I was wondering if you'd talk through, you know, a little bit about each one to give people like a little hint of, you know, if you pick up this book, hey, here's what you're going to be understanding more of. Here's what you're going to be seeing yeah. in detail. Oh, thanks for the question. It's kind of a big one. Yeah, sorry. So, <laughs> where, where do I want to, where do I want to dive in first? Yeah, so there were a couple of things that I, that I wanted to, to to talk about. And 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 we've already sort of done the the, the forgery as a romantic form of authorship, right? And the sort of the, the demands for it that later become, um, sort of demands that we take it away, right? Um, one of the arguments against uh, the, the the authenticity of the the manuscripts was that it wasn't that great poetry. It wasn't good imitation of folklore, um, and we should have seen it from the beginning, right? This is this is an argument that's made in the process of trying to debunk them, right? Um, that Hanke wasn't much of a poet, um, and neither were his his, his collaborators. You know, it's sort of on the face of it, we, sh we shouldn't have believed it, right? I don't think that that holds up. And that's one of the things that I examine and, and, and brought digital methods to, to, to use as well in examining because, um, and I went to look at the, the, the South Slavic material in particular and the, the, the songs that were being collected really at the same time by someone that um, Hanke probably meant in Vienna in 1816 or 1817, um, uh, Vuk Karadzic who collects the, the, the songs of the Serbian people and publishes them, and that's epic poetry, um, which has a very particular sort of form uh, that it's sung in. Um, and it's a form that was studied by uh, a couple of uh, Harvard scholars um, in the middle of the, the 20th century, and they developed this oral formulaic theory to talk about it. So that the, the way that these songs were sung, and when he's, when he's writing them down from the oral tradition, probably how Homeric songs were sung also. Um, and it's how the the, the Russian Vivini songs were sung. They're not memorized. Every time the singer would sing the song, the story would be slightly different, 
but the the language that they use so they're not they're they're not inventing it each time because the the story is known right um the heroes are known um the outcome is known right but the particular wording of the song changes every time so how does that happen how does someone sing and and in the south Slavic tradition you're accompanying yourself on an instrument the goose slay as well how do you sing like well-formed poetry if you're in some sense sort of composing it as you're singing it you're you're retelling it right so they have this this sort of very structured language for for telling these stories that that, that they described as formulaic right there's certain ways of saying you know how you arm yourself how you mount your horse how you leave the town right and that's often repeated and uses more or less the same words with some some variability some flexibility anytime you're telling about those kinds of departures or gathering of assemblies and so on Right. And I was struck by how similar the, the epic poems in the manuscripts were to how close they were to that South Slavic model. Hanka had translated some of that poetry published by Karadzic, so he knew it fairly well and, and he's clearly imitating it. And so I wanted to get at the question of, you know, how good is this imitation? Right. So we, we, we know quite a bit about how this poetry works because it was pretty intensely studied for for decades, um, and not just in Slavic traditions, but in, all, in Germanic traditions and in African traditions and sort of all over the place. So we know quite a bit about how this kind of poetry works and sort of making the comparison then to the closest models. And one aspect of that is how repetitive the language is, right? Because you have these sort of formulas, the ways that they, they, they tell particular scenes, they use a lot of the same descriptors, right? The same nouns, right? A horse is a horse and they're always swift. Well, in fact, in Slavic tradition, they're mostly good horses, um, but in the manuscripts, they're swift and they, they, they pick that up from a particular place. Um, and so I was looking at that. And so I had an impression about the degree to which um, these, the, these poems and the manuscripts, how well they repeat, uh, they imitated that sort of repetitive aspect, formulaic aspect of the authentic, you know, oral poetry. But how do you quantify that, right? So I can see examples, I can show you examples where they're doing it. There's other passages where it doesn't seem to be happening so much. So is there a way of, of figuring out like how repetitive the language of the, the manuscripts are in comparison to um, authentic poetry of this type, which tends to be quite highly, even ritualistically repetitive in a way, right? Um, and digital methods were the obvious answer to that, right? Because it's one thing to count by hand, right? And, and with the Czech manuscripts, you can do that to a degree because you only have um, uh, like six or 7,000 words worth of poetry there, right? But when you start wanting to comparis make comparisons to Serbian epics, you have huge, huge body of material there. So what are you going to pick? What are you going to choose? Right. And so digital methods for me were the way to get at this question. And, and I have to say, like, um, there's, there's all the talk of digital humanities is about big data, right? And maybe AI methods and like really sophisticated kinds of things. Um, what we did was pretty basic in a way. We were looking at a couple of measures for um, how repetitive the vocabulary of a text is. Um, one of the most basic measures of that is what they call type token ratio, right? Type is how many different words you have, tokens is how many total words you have. And it's just, you divide the one by the other, right? For a particular text. So if it's highly repetitive, you're gonna have a very small ratio. Right, because there's not that many unique words. There's a lot of words, but not many of them are unique. And so that was actually one of the things that we we did in comparison, comparing the, the the Czech texts to you know Russian texts and to Serbian texts that were collected out of oral traditions. How repetitive this vocabulary? And then we also compared it to published um, art poetry from the period, right? Poetry that was you know Pushkin and Zhukovsky and Russian poetry and and you know well-known authors in Serbian poetry. Um, and what we found is that the Czech, the, the manuscripts sort of fell in between. Um, and even within Czech folklore traditions versus Czech uh, literary traditions, the, the repetitiveness of the language was sort of closer. I mean, it was, it was in between. So it moved in the direction of the repetitive folkloric language, but not as far as it, it wasn't quite as repetitive as folklore, which is an interesting finding for us. Right. It suggested 
that there is a, a, a sort of successful imitation, a, success, a successful use of this um, more limited, repetitive vocabulary, but that it didn't didn't um, didn't go as far as what genuine folklore does in that direction. Do you think if you had the ability to go back in time now with this technology, you could create a more authentic forgery <laughs> with it? <laughs> um, oh, absolutely. I think we need to put gener generative AI to use to like make create more medieval traditions yes. and get sort of oral formulaic poetry. Give it a bunch of oral formulaic texts, and I think it would train itself to to like spit out new stories um, um, pretty effectively. That would be fun. <laughs> That's what we should do. No more profit motive, only uh, medieval text motive. That's right. We just want to read some good old bloody epic poems, and <laughs> what we have is not enough. Make give us some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, was, I got rather technical there. No, no, that was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, that was, uh, you know, at a certain point, it came clear to me that I couldn't do it by hand. I couldn't <laughs> just do it by counting, right? Mm. And, and there's one thing to record your impression about how, you know, it seems to be moving the right direction, right? But maybe not be as as, as repetitive as these texts, gen, genuine texts are. Uh, but to be able to quantify that was, was uh, I think, an important thing to attempt. I like the graph just... As as a literary person, my palms start to sweat whenever there's graphs and books and I'm reading. <laughs> See, I was a math and English double major in college, so finally I'm bringing my the, the math side of things back, and I didn't know that I would ever do that, but here it is. Yeah. Well, um, thankfully your graph is in color, so it's readable. A lot of times you'll get these like kind of these these books and they'll they'll throw a graph in there, which seems like it's going to be great, and then it's black and white, and you can't distinguish what they're doing. Here's the dirty secret. I paid. I had to pay money out of my research funds to for a subvention to get color illustrations in the book. So, well, I think it was worth it. I, I, I invested in making sure I that you could see the different colors in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, for those of you who pick it up and see it, no, just now appreciate those color graphs. Linger on them a little longer. That's right. <laughs> um, the last kind of thing that I wanted to touch on was the. Well, we talked a little bit about the sort of nationalist group uh in the time when these were being created right but i am so fascinated by the current jack manuscript society which you talk about a little bit how they continue to defend the authenticity of these manuscripts and it kind of makes me wonder well first of all it makes me think wow that's that's really fun uh but two it kind of makes me wonder in the sense does it really matter that they were forgeries at all if they spawned this really wonderful literature that comes after it, did they achieve their purpose? And, you know, kind of, I guess as a, my own concluding thought, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much it matters. And that's what this book made me rethink. Because when I went into this, I had the same thing where I thought, yeah, forgery is bad. We shouldn't do forgery. <laughs> but then after reading it, I kind of thought, well... Maybe it's okay. Then Matt left yeah. it and he was like, well, maybe the check doesn't have to be completely correct when I give it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is something that I've, I've had to like think about quite a bit, right? Because I am sort of arguing for the efficacy of forgery, right? Um, and I think it's important. I, I, I don't want to be advocating for making things up. I mean, I think these, these, these show us how powerful stories are. Um, and how important they are for like for for bringing people together and mobilizing them, right? But if but if you do it sort of like the 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 knowing falsification, right? Deep fakes and these kinds of things that are intended to fool people, I actually think that's different from what this, this is. In part because I you know what I said, they were aiming at a larger truth behind it that they thought that reality was somehow missing, right? In in the, the reality of their manuscript, and so I they, they were aiming. Is not to deceive so much as to, to sort of recreate, right? Um, and so, insofar as we know, right? I mean, they're also aiming to deceive, right? But so there, there, there's a mix of motivations there. Um, and I think it's important to, 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 we have to, we have to say today that they're false because our standards of truth and you know um evidence and how you read the evidence and so on how we understand the development of language you know we can no longer say that they're genuine right but in the period when they functioned as genuine the horizons of knowledge were such that you you could question it but you didn't know enough to to have to have to make a definitive statement that they weren't true 
And that sort of happens at the end of the 19th century, where the, these these scholars felt like it's incumbent on us, right, to 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 acknowledge that by contemporary standards, right, these are not true anymore, right? And so, you know, I think we have to, like, the history gives us um, sort of a moving target for truth, right? It's what, what's true today is not what was true uh, 200 years ago or 150 years ago, right? And gives us maybe also a, an encouragement to be a little bit um, humble about our own sort of feeling that we know what truth is today, right? Um, and I think that, you know, I'm not arguing that we should, you know, we should make effective um, falsifications because I think that we have to try to tell the truth. But I think we have to recognize that with some, you know, some of the things that we hold to be true today, we might not hold to be true 20 years from now, right? Um, and be be humble in what we're offering. But I think we also have to be forthright in offering narratives for people to help them understand the world understand our political history, understand where we want to go as a people, right? We live through stories. That's how we, that's what we're like as humans, right? And all of our stories are fictions at some level, and they all attempt to approximate truth, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, we, we want to tell stories and we want to, we want to try to tell the truth in telling those stories, but we have to recognize that at some level, um, we're probably lying all the time in that process, right? And be willing to come back and critique later and say, yeah, so we, we didn't have the whole picture then, or, you know, we understood things differently than we do now. Maybe it's better now, right? But it's a process. Definitely. And uh, you, speaking of it as a process, you kind of, as, as um, unless Matt has any last questions, I think it's interesting that you, you point out that in some ways it could even be considered beneficial that these forgeries were kind of, well, Beneficial in the sense that if it already happened, we can look at some silver linings here that, um, mm -hmm. you know, Czech politics in a way, or at least to some degree, have had to come to terms with the fact that their own national mythos is is created or manufactured to a certain degree. And not to say that like, it's mm -hmm. not pulling from real trends, as we're talking about, but like our foundational texts are an attempt to recreate this and we have to come to terms with that, that we are also creating our own mythos. And you kind of say, like, maybe that's been beneficial for for you know these 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 subsections a way that maybe other countries who have also done similar things maybe not to the same degree have not or have not had to confront i think i think that it had a real concrete effect on czech nationalism and czech national identity in that it sort of shook the foundations and 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 i think the czechs don't hold on to um their national identity and and, and particular sort of certain ways of formulating it too strongly, right? Because they had a very strong identification that then they had to completely rethink, right? And so I think that the, the, the Czechs have a uh, healthy skepticism towards their uh, their self-understanding. Um, they don't hold on to even, you know, language was critical to their, their national awakening. But if you look at what happens to Czechs in immigration, they don't hold on to their language in the same way that uh, Russians do or Poles do or Ukrainians do, right? They're not attached to it as a part of their identity quite so strongly. And I think that actually the, the, this is part of the effect of the, the manuscripts and the, 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 the reconciliation with the falsity of the manuscripts. The Czechs, the Czechs sort of take their, their nationalism more lightly. Partly it's also they're a small nation. They can't, you know, sort of be like, you know, brusquely brushing around Europe and, and with their, with their <laughs> nationalism, right? It's, they, they don't have the numbers or the, the, the military might to do that. So there's a, there's a humility that comes from the size, but I think there's a humility too that comes from a sort of, you know, a history that is, has sort of shaken up their um their initial sort of configuration of what what they thought their national identity was and what it was based on right and to have to come to a a, a more modern contemporary way of, of self-understanding is also more skeptical self-understanding for them yeah that's interesting it's funny because like my own grandfather czech immigrant who just like very Czech kind of guy, or very, I guess, I should say Eastern European kind of guy. No interest in teaching any of his kids anything about that. Yeah. Did not pass down, even in the slightest, um, you know, one generation in. So that's, you know, interesting.
and that's that's entirely common for 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 Czech immigration. Um, and I blame the manuscripts. And now you've had to learn to pickle on your own. <laughs> that's right. And because of the Czech manuscripts, I now have to relearn how to pickle, and that's a real shame. Uh, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this has been super interesting. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. This has been a really wonderful. I mean, first of all, so if you're for those of you listening, you should get the book. And I'm glad you made it to this point because this has been, I think, even after going through it, a really illuminating conversation. Um, getting more getting more thoughts on it. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for your great questions. And as we're wrapping up, now is probably a good time to mention that next week our episode is going back to Life and Fate, kind of going back right at every day. Uh, Life and Fate Part 1, Chapters 32 through 60. So if you have not already uh, joined in with our chapter day read-along, uh, you should consider it. It's not too much reading, and we're releasing an email and a short episode every morning analyzing that day's chapter, as well as giving room to some comments that people have had about it. So if you are not yet a part of it, head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com slash life and fate 24 for more information and to help keep our show independent, as well as for exclusive access to notes containing all the research that went into this episode, head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. And before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current supporters, Erica, Michelle, Juliana, Diane, Oleg, John, Timex, Melissa, Baron, Aldo, Ben, Gabe, George, Claire, Amy, Allie, Soraya, Jackson, Molly, Emma, Mike, Marianne, Mickey, Eric, Mike, Peter, Claire, Ben, Jeff, Inez, Mai, Robert, Joseph, Daniel, Lou, Nina, Gary, Janice, Mary, Anne, Isaac, Emily, Amanda, Caitlin, Yitza, Irini, and Akrob. The music used in this episode was Staraya Kino by Perumotka. You can find more of their stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify. The links and spelling are in the show notes. You'll hear from us again soon. <laughs>